Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Judah Levine. I'm head of research at Freedos Group. Um, and welcome to our webinar on inventory and supply chain management as we look towards the end of this year and into the next. So in the next 40 minutes or so, we're going to talk about inventory and supply chain management, given all the kind of volatility that we've had over the last couple of years. Um, but to get kind of, first of all, a picture of, uh, you know, one indication of that, of that volatility, um, I'll start us off with a short uh, market update in terms of what's going on in international ocean logistics. Um, before I'll hand off to Emma from 8FIG, who's going to zoom in on e-commerce retailers, what the impact has been on, uh, on the, those types of importers, um, and some best practices in terms of what they've been hearing in terms of logistics, but also some key insights uh, in terms of how to best manage your supply chain uh, and your um, uh, inventory levels during tumultuous times like this. But before we jump in, I'd also like to mention that we're also being joined by Ayam Tan, who is a customer success manager at Fritos. Um, and uh, she will answer any questions you might have uh, in terms of Fredos.com or in terms of you know, the more operational side of, of shipping. So please feel free to use the Q&A function at any point during, the, uh, during our presentation uh, to ask any questions you might have. Um, I am, might answer some of them directly during the, uh, uh, you know, during the, the webinar, uh, but we'll also hopefully have some time to answer some questions um, at the end, but feel free to ask questions uh, whenever they arise. Um, so before we jump in, I'd like to uh, introduce Emma Borokov, who's from uh, 8FIG as the head of marketing, and ask Emma, please, to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about 8FIG before we get started. Awesome. Thanks, Judah. Um, and hi, guys. Yeah, Emma from AFIG here, uh, located in sunny Austin, where fall is just a myth. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, happy Thursday, guys. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about um, AFIG. So we're a, a funding and planning platform. So basically, we have a planning tool for sellers, um, e-commerce sellers. So Amazon, Shopify, um, whatever your, your platform is. Um, so you basically kind of build out... Um, each line of inventory, like what are the costs associated with um, the deposit, the freight, that sort of thing. Um, so you really build that out over the course of six to 12 months. And then we work with you to pinpoint those areas where you're going to be experiencing uh, the most cash flow crunch. Um, and then when we fund you, we fund you um, incrementally, give you the funds that you need when you need it, according to your plan. And what's really great about that as well, that the plan is, is flexible. So you can kind of change things as you go. You're selling more, you're selling less. Um, the, you know, your inventory is delayed. Um, we really try to align, uh, your needs with reality of how the supply chain is affecting you. Um, so, so yeah, that is, that is AFIG in a nutshell. And back to you, Judah. Thank you very much. Okay. So Emma, we're going to come back to you in a minute, but first, as I said, uh, I'm going to give a short overview of what's been going on in ocean logistics in terms of the international part of, uh, of importing. Um, and, uh, before heading back to Emma to hear more about um, you know, supply chain for e-commerce sellers specifically and uh, inventory management. So uh, here we're looking at a chart from our Freydos Baltic Index, which is an index of spot rates for ocean shipping containers for 40 foot containers uh, on different major trade lanes. And we're looking at the prices per container um, on several major trade lanes. The lines uh, in blue on this graph are the Trans-Pacific. So the dark blue is Asia to the US West Coast and light blue is to the East Coast. Uh, and the yellow line is uh, Asia Europe, and the green is transatlantic. Um, so before we talk about kind of what's going on right now, it's important to understand how we got here and what's been going on uh, in the last couple of years. And as I'm sure as, as all of you know, uh, acutely at the start of the pandemic, or really in about June of 2020, there was a big shift, um, especially among U.S. consumers uh, in spending on goods. So as people were, were stuck at home, there was a big jump in spending on, uh, on goods when people you know, couldn't go out and spend on services, and particularly on goods that people were using for their home, home offices, uh, exercise equipment, lots of other things, um, where there's a, in, uh, an increase in spending. Um, and what happened in those first few months was this first initial in, uh, increase in spending on, on goods during the pandemic, and that caused uh, ocean rates to, to, um, to double, which at the time we thought was very significant, right? Rates went from about $1,500 or $2,000 to around $4,000, $5,000 to the East Coast. Um, but as we headed in uh, further into uh, uh, 2021, um, basically there was a continuous increase in volumes. To the year of 2021 for the year ended up with 25% more uh, 
uh, imported containers compared to 2019. So a very, very significant increase in volumes. And that increase in, in demand for ocean freight uh, meant that uh, ocean prices continued to climb. And of course, we had other disruptions like the blockage of the Suez, which impacted more uh, European importers than it did uh, shippers to the US. Uh, we had a corona outbreak at Yanchen, which again, at this point seems quaint uh, compared to what we saw in Shanghai much later on. Um, but as we went into peak season of 2021, so, so peak season every year, as again, most of you probably know firsthand, um, for ocean shipping that starts around July or August and usually trails off, um, excuse me, usually trails off in uh, uh, October, or early November. And that's when all the goods that are being uh, shipped over by ocean um, need to come in ahead of time for the, for the holiday seasons, you know, starting with, uh, with uh, Thanksgiving and then, and then uh, on through the end of the year. Um, so there's generally an increase in demand, an increase in, in prices, an increase in volumes around that time. But as we had this kind of sustained, almost peak levels of, of demand earlier leading up into the year, there was an extreme jump in, in prices um, as we got towards peak season of last year. And that was because we had this extreme demand. We had ocean carriers basically putting all available vessels, you know, as much capacity as they could towards, towards, the, um, towards that uh, demand and those volumes. But we also had an extreme problem with congestion. So, you know, it's easy to move container ships around to different places, but port uh, capacity is much more limited. And this just kind of the sustained peak um, of volumes that kept coming in overwhelmed the ports. I think probably a lot of people remember, you know, video or pictures of, you know, a hundred ships waiting off the coast of, uh, uh, of Southern California waiting to get into to LA Long Beach. And that pushed um, prices to, to record highs. So to the, to the uh, West Coast above $20,000 per container, whereas, you know, in 2019, probably the peak was around $2,000. Um, so 10 times, uh, 10 times the norm. Uh, as we came down from peak season last year, rates really stayed at a, at a very elevated level. So they came down, we had kind of the seasonality, but they came down, um, but stayed quite, quite elevated. So here to the West Coast, we had about $15,000 per container, uh, which again, typical for that time of year would be between 1,000 and 1,500. So about, still about 10 times the norm for that time of year. Um, and then we had the Shanghai lockdown. So we had this COVID outbreak in, uh, in China, Shanghai shut down. The expectation was that, you know, manufacturing is closing and there's going to be, uh, you know, a lull while we're waiting for that, for that pent up demand um, to, uh, to be, you know, supplied again as manufacturing opened again. And what happened was as Shanghai opened, it started to reopen um, in June, rates continued to fall. So we saw rates falling initially and the, the hypothesis was, well, rates are falling because you can't get anything out of China. So there's less demand. Um, as as things started to reopen and rates continued uh, to fall, this was the first indication that really, you know, the demand situation, the underlying demand situation has changed. And it's right around that time in June that we also had reports from uh, major retailers like Walmart and Target that all of a sudden they had excess inventory. So again, as many of you know, probably firsthand, uh, over this, you know, year or two of, of uh, congestion and delays and increased uh, spending in, um, for in a lot of uh, you know in a lot of different types of goods, uh, there was a lot of problems building up inventory. So inventories had had run down, and it was very hard to build up inventories back to back to an appropriate level um, or kind of the buffer that that most retailers like to have. And all of a sudden, we heard reports of of excess demand. And really, since then, we've just seen rates continue to fall. So at this point, the latest numbers are for uh, Asia to the U.S. West Coast. Uh, current prices are at about $3,000 per container. Uh, to the East Coast, they're about $7,000 per container. So to the West Coast, rates have fallen about 80% um, since about February. And to the East Coast, um, about 50%, which is also very significant, down from about $17,000. Um, so what, what kind of is the driver of these kind of, uh, uh, of shift that we're seeing? So I think it's multi-factors. So one is, is most likely inflation, right? So as things have become more expensive, um, consumers are spending more on necessities and less for other types of goods. So some of that is, is impacting that demand. Um, the other is shift to other types of goods. Um, so in terms of like back to Walmart and Target, some of the buildup inventories we saw was along you know, specific categories like, um, like electronics and different types of home goods uh, and things like that. Uh, there's also a shift in, in types of goods that people were um, were buying because of you know the changing conditions in terms of what's happened with the pandemic. As the pandemic has really kind of receded in, in, in the U.S., 
and, and things are much more open. People are shifting the types of apparel they're buying. They're shifting the types of, of goods they're buying. They're also spending more on services, which also impacted that kind of uh, uh, demand for, for goods. And then the final piece I think was that, you know, we had, as I said, we had this very uh, uh, elevated rates earlier in the year. And normally this time of year that we're in right now and earlier in the summer, we would have seen an uh, increase in demand an increase in, uh, in volumes and an increase in rates. And now we've seen rates just continue to fall during the time of year when normally they'd be, they'd be climbing. And, and I think a lot of that has been a, a pull forward. So because of all the delays that we had last year, because of all the congestion, especially on the West Coast, a lot of importers were making those peak season uh, orders earlier. So it's really possible that this was really uh, peak season, this kind of sustained $15,000 per container was really um, uh, most of the peak season. Then combine that with uh, a decrease in demand, a shift in spending on services, and that's when we start to see rates coming down. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though, is you know we're, we're definitely seeing a change. I'm seeing rates come down $3,000. They haven't been at that, at that level since about, um, um, uh, August of 2020, so it's been a long time. Um, but uh, rates are still, uh, you know, quite high. So at $3,000, that's about 125% higher than they were in September 2019. At $7,000, that's about 150% higher than than uh, pre-pandemic. So rates are still quite elevated, and especially if you talk to the East Coast. Um, another factor in terms of what's going on right now, as as we said, you know, there were in January, uh, at the beginning of the year, there was more than 100 ships waiting um, off the coast of, uh, of Southern California. Uh, now that number is down to about eight. And it's not just because of the different steps, and there are many, many different measures taken by the ports to try and improve uh, you know, the, the uh, flow of containers through, um, through the container yards, but it's also because of how difficult last year was on the West Coast, a lot of importers have shifted to the East Coast. So they've shipped earlier, so it takes longer to get to the East Coast. They ship earlier and they've also shipped to the East Coast instead of uh, to the West Coast. And so that's improved conditions on the West Coast. It's actually made things worse on the East Coast. So whereas there were, you know, as I said, 108 ships in January um, waiting off the coast of, uh, of Southern California, uh, now there's just eight, but there's 20 waiting off of New York, New Jersey, and there's or double digits off Savannah and other places. So some of that congestion has been shifted along even though overall the volume situation is, uh, is uh, decreasing. Now the decrease in volumes also, you know, this looks very dramatic and it is, the decrease in volumes, at least according to the National Retail Federation of the latest pro projections, that volumes have been, uh, imports to the US have been decreasing gradually since about May, um, but it's not a steep fall off. It's kind of, you know, a few percentage uh, points um, month by month. Um, which again is different than what we've seen throughout the last couple of years where these you know, volumes have remained extremely elevated all the way through. But again, if we compare to 2019, these are still um, higher by about double digits um, compared to the 2019. So volumes are decreasing, but they're coming just like rates are coming from a very, um, a very elevated place. So rates are, uh, are falling, uh, volumes are decreasing, but still if we look to relative to 2019, um, things are still quite uh, strong in terms of, uh, you know, more historical norms. So um, for shippers, you know, it depends on the types of, of goods, obviously. So the fact that there's still quite strong volumes, although not the extremes that we've seen in the last couple of years, means that, you know, there is still demand. Uh, shippers, importers are still bringing things in. It, pro it, it may likely depend on the types of goods you bring in, you know, the types of swings of demand that, that you're seeing yourself. But um, from kind of a, an operational or strategic point, you know, if you do, if there is demand, so we can say now that it's a lot less expensive to ship now than it has been, um, you know, in the last two years. Um, and uh, also there's a consideration of, of which ports you want to uh, ship to. So one is the price. Um, and then if we look at, at our this next slide, this is looking at transit time. So this is from our Freitas.com marketplace. This is the average number of days it took to receive uh, shipments shipped from China to the United States. And we see that pre-pandemic, um, the typical was more around 40 days. It got up to about 80 days during that peak of congestion that we talked about uh, earlier this year. But since then, that's been coming down. Now the average is about 60. And that's still quite elevated. This lumps together East Coast and West Coast together. It's very possible if we split the two, we'd see a much steeper drop for, for the West Coast um, as congestion has improved. So those are kind of, from the operational side, uh, the, the first thing is that it's obviously now a lot less expensive than it's been um, in the near past. 
Uh, and secondly, is that the, the transit time will also will be a lot shorter than, than what we've been experiencing for much of the last couple of years. So that's kind of the, the ocean uh, roundup. Um, and with that, you know, there's been so much volatility as we've seen. There's been a lot of tough decisions to make as importers the last couple of years, you know, because of things were so expensive, how much to order, when to order. Um, you know, probably for much of the time, the answer was as much as you can, as, as soon as you can, because things are so delayed. Now that things are starting to unwind, um, it gets a little bit more nuanced. Uh, questions of inventory management and cash flow management become that more important when we're trying to think of, um, uh, of you know, exactly how to operate now that things are, are starting to change. Um, and that's where, why we're excited to have experts like uh, Aidfig to come and, and uh, kind of shed some light on that for us in terms of best practices. But before we get into the inventory management part, and uh, now, um, Emma, I'm gonna hand over to you. Um, before getting to that side, what are you hearing specifically uh, from e-commerce importers uh, in terms of the logistics impact? Yeah, thanks, Judah. And that was um, super insightful. Um, I think it's been quite a, the roller coaster over the past few years. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of kind of what we're hear hearing from sellers is just the importance of um, diversifying the supply chain and being really proactive in that planning. Um, we see a lot of sellers, like especially ones who are just starting out who are, or newer, they kind of, you know, they, they have a few relationships and those work for them. And then they don't necessarily build out multiple relationships um, per supplier type. So I think that's just like, you know, it seems straightforward, but I think it's just like ultimately crucial, especially if you're working on, you know, launching a new product or something like just straight from the get-go, making sure that you're talking to multiple suppliers um, so that you can, you know, part of it is like price comparing and then also being able to kind of leverage those costs um, against others and kind of get something that is very beneficial for you. Um, but I think it's also understanding really like the opportunity costs and, you know, where do you want to focus? Like, I think you look at some suppliers who, you know, you can get a great bang for your buck, um, but, you know, it's a, it's a longer time to get what you need um, or vice versa, or maybe it's, you know, quality above all else, but the price point's higher and it takes a longer time as well. So I think it's really understanding those areas that you want to focus on. Um, Cause you know, I mean, I love to say you can get it all, but, you know, usually it, it's kind of really drilling down on on what um, is the most important to you. And I think also having suppliers who, you know, are, you know, you could have five spectacular suppliers, but their areas of um, kind of strength are all in the same place. You're not really diversifying. Um, mm -hmm. So making sure that you're kind of filling in those gaps um, where needed. And like one of our sellers, Jessica, who um, actually experienced growth um, under a year from 50K to, to 3 million in revenue. Um, so that was one of her biggest <laughs> problems was just sticking with, you know, one supplier, one freight forwarder, you know, that sort of thing. And so really kind of building out that network, growing those relationships and doing it before you're, you're in a pickle um, so that you have those relationships built already is, is massive. Yeah. And that's interesting. Well, we've run uh, several surveys checking in with uh, mostly SMB, mostly e-commerce sellers who use Fredos.com to, to book international freight, um, you know, checking in at different times of the pandemic to see kind of how the, you know, disruptions, volatility have been impacting them. And one of the questions we asked is like, what are some of the strategies you're taking, you know, to try and, um, you know, optimize your logistics operations despite all this, this kind of volatility. Um, and there were a lot of different, you know, we gave a lot of different options and there were a lot of different answers, but one of the, um, you know, one of the, the groups that, that was, uh, that, that a lot of um, shippers pointed to was, you know, trying to partner with more logistics partners. Um, and, you know, whether it's through freighters.com where, you know, you can see a list of freight forwarders and, and compare options and, and compare prices or, uh, you know, offline through building different relationships. That was one of, one of uh, the keys. And, I, you know, I really think what we saw from that, there was there was no kind of silver bullet. So there were a lot of different things that, that people were trying because it was so, um, you know, really tumultuous. But uh, that was definitely one of them. So it's interesting to see that confirmed in this, uh, you know, in your experience. Yeah, awesome. I, yeah, I agree. There's <laughs> unfortunately no silver bullet. Um, I think it's really just, yeah, having those plan A, B, C, having those relationships beforehand um, and, and taking that time to build those out. And yeah, whether it's through a platform or something you're managing on a spreadsheet, it's just like <laughs> absolutely crucial. 
Um, great. Next slide. Um, so yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, being proactive about it is, is super important. I mean, we see a lot of um, smaller sellers, small to medium size, like, you know, only 22% of them, um, I believe we got this from McKinsey, um, actually do this. And I understand, you know, bandwidth is a huge issue, but it's really as you're building out your supply chain, as you're finding these these um, suppliers is making sure that you're talking to multiple per, you know, every segment. Um, and yeah, because clearly if, if there's a disruption, which there will be, um, we, you know, that can cause 62% loss in finance. And I think this was also the McKinsey one. Obviously, I mean, everyone knows like the disruptions it can cause, especially going into Q4. We've had that with a lot of like very seasonal sellers who, if their Q4 gets messed up, their, their year, like, you know, Q4 is massive. Um, and so I think it also comes down to not just um, having a very flexible, proactive supply chain, but um, I think inventory management is massive as well. Um, and so really making sure that you're going to have enough inventory going into this quarter. Um, and, you know, there's definitely a balance, like you don't want to order too much. I think there's um, multiple variable variables you can be looking at. Like one of them is demand forecasting, for instance, um, is really looking at kind of the trend, you know, your personal like trends and sales, as well as looking forward, um, you know, what can you anticipate? Maybe the product you have is like, there's going to be a new version of it in a few months and your whole stock will be, you know, not very useful anymore. I think really mm -hmm. staying in tune with those kinds of trends as well as like what is very specific to, um, your store, um, you know, how fast do you usually move product? Um, what is the lead time to get those products into your store? Um, you know, obviously like things are a little bit better than they were, but it's still not back to 2019. I think we still see, um, typically between like, I mean, this is a very like bulk aggregate number, but like three to six months, um, in terms of getting most of our sellers experience that in terms of getting their inventory in the door. And obviously the difference between three and six months is, you know, that's, that's a whole quarter. So, um, making sure that you're planning that in advance and that you have enough stock. Um, I think I'm ready for my next slide. Yeah. So I was going to, if, if we dive into the actual, um, you know, uh, inventory and the cash flow management part of it, what are some of the, the best practices and most important things that, that you're seeing that you recommend to your clients? Yeah. So, um, definitely, I mean, that best practices is having an inventory management tool in the first place. Um, it's something, you know, we have at eight fig, um, but you know, there's, there's other tools as well that you can take advantage of and making sure that I think even just having a record of like how, um, how fast you're moving things, like what is like the average shipment time, how fast are you moving certain products? Um, you know, how long are things sitting there? Like all those things you need to be tracking. You need to be aware of these numbers. It's going to be different for every store, every vendor, and obviously it's going to change. So I think as much as you can have a record of those pieces and constantly be doing that, that sets you up for, um, you know, having a much better time. Um, and then, yeah, like a, one of our customers, Felix is, I mean, if it, especially if you're an Amazon seller, it is very painful to go out of stock. I mean, Amazon, you know, it has, it has all its, its, its rules and kind of ways of kind of making you pay for, you know, things like, like stock selling out. Um, you invested a lot of time, money, energy to get certain rankings. And if you're out of stock, like you lose that you're docked, you're at the bottom. Um, so, you know, and that's something that a lot of our sellers have experienced and, you know, we really do recommend, you know, making sure that you're going to have enough and like, probably ordering more than maybe you're used to, especially like as you're planning to grow and scale, like you need to think, um, you know, not the status quo, but like, how can you actually um, continue to, to, to grow your, your store as well? Um, yeah. And I think also um, a trend that we've definitely seen as well, like I, before the pandemic, there was a, a lot, a lot of sellers spent most of their time focusing on kind of their marketing and advertising strategy. Um, how are they going to get, you know, how are they competing against competitors, the positioning, the ad channels are using. Um, so we've seen a lot more sellers. I think <laughs> the pandemic made people really realize how important it is to, to spend time on, you know, optimizing your supply chain, finding those other um, vendors and really like laying things out in terms of understanding where you're going to be short on cash, especially um, because you need, I mean, you need to 
upfront costs before you can really make the money off of that um, kind of product. So um, something I'm glad people are starting to, you know, put a little elbow grease into it, but I think there's definitely a lot more room to um, being able to be like a little bit more proactive as well. I think next slide. Um, cool. So, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I mentioned before we, we are, we do have a planning tool component as, as part of our whole like holistic product. Um, so even if you aren't, you know, looking for funding, like we still have this tool available for free. Um, but anyways, it, it can really just help you understand like, what are the points that you need to be upfronting cash, um, for your inventory and where are the moments that you are going to be really that like the shortest following the shortest um and and just laying that out allows you to really understand and prepare in a way that um you know even even just like putting the plan together even though the plan will change and updating as you go can make a massive difference um and i think especially as you grow like you're not able to just you know take what you get out and put it back in like there's a point where you know, that's not going to be enough to grow that will just maintain kind of your size and status quo. Um, and I think especially as you want to experiment and find new products, you're going to need more money for um, R&D and that sort of thing. So to be able to have cash to just put into inventory and to, you know, maintain the machine you're growing already while, you know, building and adding new products like you yeah, a lot of times, like we see a lot of sellers just, it comes down to just lack of cash and it's not lack of having a good product or having, um, you know, kind of a plan in place. It's, it's, yeah. So I think next slide. <laughs> okay. Um, awesome. So yeah, I think at the end of the day, um, it's not, yeah, it's not just about maintaining, but it's about growing. And I think it's, um, really important to at from all aspects of making sure you have a very flexible supply chain, making sure inventory management is massive and really understanding those variables of, you know, what's the cost of good, what's the lead time it takes to get the product um, to where you're able to sell it, um, what is the demand, how is that going to change? Um, and so it's really just kind of a cycle and and kind of tracking those variables in the first place that will allow you to be in a better place. Like you can't yeah, uh, you can be better prepared. You can't know what's going to happen, but I think those are just aspects that um, a lot of people kind of take for granted, and it's something that you know most everyone can can start doing, you know, today. Cool. Um, that's great. I mean, I think you know that that kind of wraps up what each of us uh, you know plan plan to bring to the table. But I think you know these are, as you said, these are two sides of the, of the same coin. One is trying to optimize the, the supply chain part, or rather the logistics part, um, and trying to make sure you're able to get the goods. The other is to to make sure that you have the, the cash flow to keep the inventory where you need it to be, um, depending on where those you know demand trends are. And so I think those are really two sides of of, of the same coin. Um, and just to kind of sum up the the key points that we were looking at. Uh, in terms of logistics, as we, as we said, you know, in terms of the, the ocean freight part of it, um, we're definitely, you know, hitting an inflection point where rates are starting to come down or volumes are starting to come down, but they're coming down from a place of, you know, extreme, you know, record highs and a lot of different measures, both in volumes, both in terms of, of costs. Um, as we see those, those uh, coming down, there's still a lot of volatility, but it also opens up some kinds of, uh, of opportunities. One, as we said, there will start to be lower costs. Um, which means, you know, um, you know, better margins or the ability to, to uh, have more competitive prices. Um, on the one hand, and on the other hand, we're going to start to see, you know, shorter turn times and, and shorter transit times as some of that congestion starts to unwind, um, both as, you know, in terms of measures that are, that are being put into place to, to improve congestion and also in terms of, um, you know, lower volumes that allow some of that congestion uh, to unwind. Um, so, you know, as we said, one of the, the keys uh, that we heard from our, uh, you know, from, from uh, shippers and importers who use uh, freighters.com, and as, as you've been hearing from, uh, from your uh, customers at, at 8Fig as well, e-commerce sellers, um, one key is, is diversification, right? Being able to see different options, try different things. Sometimes it means trying different modes. At this point, it might mean shifting if you have that flexibility. Um, looking at different destinations, if you know, if you've always been going to the East Coast or always to the West Coast, um, it it pays to a to kind of diversify, 
as we said, look at the different options and B, to stay on top of what's going on in the market itself, make decisions that way. Um, so those kind of from the logistics side, those were, were I think the key takeaways. And Emma, I'll let you speak to the, the more inventory management side of the, of the Yeah, um, so yeah, planning your inventory um, at least three to six months in advance um, is massive. I think there's still um, plenty of delays and just like, you know, missing your Q4 can really just shoot yourself on the foot. Um, so trying to avoid that as much as possible. Um, and then I think just like um, being able to factor in understanding your cash flow in a way of like, where are you going to be lacking the most? And when do you really looking at each kind of batch of inventory and understanding the points that you need that cash up front um, to help you prioritize like how and when you're going to order more, um, as well as, you know, when you might need a bit more capital. All right. Cool. Well, thank you. That was great. Um, now we're going to turn over to some questions. And there were some questions um, coming through the, for the Q&A. So, uh, Emma, I will refer a couple of these to you if these are something that you can shed light on. So the first one is, um, how do you get access to the new kind of funding from AFIC to finance their platform? Like, I guess is asking, what's the actual process to get that kind of Wait, was that a question to me? Sorry, could you can you repeat that? I was reading the question. No, no worries. So this question was, um, how can we have access to the new kind of funding available uh, for to finance the platform? So I guess that, that that question is asking, what is the process uh, in terms of um, uh, you know uh, cash flow management through? Perfect. Yeah, I also see someone asked um, about needing a credit score to get it as well, so I can hit those both out. So we um so. We do not look at, we only look at the business. We don't look at anything associated with the owner of the business. We don't look at credit score. We don't take collateral. Um, it's all based off of you need to have a store for at least six months. I um, mean, you need to be either at six digits in revenue a year or the run rate of six digits. So that could be like 8K in revenue a month over the last three months. Um, so really just looking at the sales data and some of those variables in terms of um, you know, the seasonality of the product and, um, you know, also what the seller is like, a lot of it is, comes down to you as the seller, like we're not telling you, oh, you can get this much money. We're asking you how much you want. And then we're kind of, you know, validating that and working with you to say like, if, if that's realistic. Um, so we, you know, obviously it comes down to what, what you're asking for, um, you know, what is your history of success? Um, and, and yeah, so it's, it's a lot more, um, a lot less to look at in terms of um, kind of your typical like funding process. Got it. And, um, Interesting. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I guess go to go to apeg.co to get started. For more um, but yeah. Cool. Um, there's one question that I can handle. The question was, do we have cost trends for ocean transport leaving North America to Asia and Europe? And the answer is, is yes. I don't have the data on hand. Um, but in terms of uh, container rates for exports, those are also available th through FBX. Um, and you can access FBX data and ocean rates um, at fbx.fairs.com by creating a free account. Um, you can see the uh, weekly rates for, um, for 12 different lanes, both head haul and, and back haul. So this would be the back haul um, for the Trans-Pacific. And that's, that's definitely available at fbx.fairs.com. Um, Let's see, here's another one for you, Emma. Are there any risks of using a fig to scale my business? Um, yeah, so we we take all the risks. Um, yeah, so like in terms of um, we, you, we don't start getting your remittances, like what you pay back until you're actually starting to sell. Um, so yeah, we kind of look at your store and decide, you know, if that's, something like we're going to move forward with. And it's usually like, we are able to work with a lot of different situations. So I say, even if you feel like you might be on the line, I could still give it a go, like reach out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I guess we, <laughs> we take the risk. Um, Got it. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Um, I think one more for you. Uh, you said 8FIG does continuous capital. What does that mean and how does that work? 
Yeah. So um, continuous capital, I mean that the, instead of getting a lump sum, it's, it's incremental. So um, kind of based off of the plan that you build out, that's, you know, we, we pinpoint those areas where you need that cash and you get that cash that you need when you need it based off of that plan. So um, yeah, you get that in chunks according to what you said you needed. And, and yeah, you can change that as you go because we do expect things, um, things to change. So yeah, that's kind of what we mean. Okay, cool. We have another one here. Do you also provide funding for all products or only a certain type of consumer product? Or only certain types of consumer products? Yeah, we provide funding for um, most products. I'd say we don't, things we don't provide funding for, we don't um, fund drop shipping um, and we don't currently fund handmade products. Um, and I think there might be a few other things, um, but I would definitely say like reach out. I think we definitely fund the vast majority of consumer products. Um, how much we don't oh, do. I think we have one more for you and then uh, I think we can wrap it up. Um, things change in my business. How does the eight fig planning work with sellers that have to adjust a lot? I worry about planning three to six months ahead because I want to be able to stay flexible. Yeah, so we have something called change request that is a huge piece of our, our tool and our funding process um, where you can put in requests um, that uh, you want to change things as you go. Um, and so we do have a dedicated success, uh, customer success team as well to work with you. Um, yeah, so that's kind of like, that's definitely something that's built into our process when you make sure that you have someone of your point person to work with you as you go. Um, yeah, I mean, we really have, I mean, we do see a lot of sellers who are hesitant about putting together, you know, a plan over the next 12 months. And I think that um, it's the kind of a, the core, our core approach is understanding that it will change. Like we do want you to make changes as you go. Um, it also gives us, you know, a lot more information about your business and how things are going so that we can better support you. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's just built into our product and um, we do have people who are able to, um, work with you as, as things come up. Awesome. Well, Emma, thank you very much for your time and for your insights. I really appreciate it. Uh, as you can see on the screen, if you have other questions for 8fig, uh, you can reach them in these various ways, including at grow at 8fig.co. Um, if you want to learn more about shipping on the freighters.com marketplace, you can go to ship.freighters.com. And if you have questions, uh, more specific questions, you can reach out to Aya at success at freighters.com. There was one more question about FBX data and uh, accessibility of um, container rate data um, by API. Um, and so that's accessible at, at fbx.freightos.com. You can see the, the index there. Um, and you can reach out to fbx at freightos.com uh, for questions about API connections, which are, which are um, available uh, as a subscription. So that'd be fbx at freightos.com for that type of question. And I think that's it. We made it in uh, 40 minutes as promised. Um, and uh, I think that was great. Thanks for attending, everyone. Thank you, Emma, and uh, thank you, Aya, for, for supporting, and um, thanks for joining. See you next time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.